Hello everyone, my name is Ben and I teach people about the anatomy of lifting. Today we're going to go over my full push day. Now this is a push day that is for the chest primarily, uh, the upper and lower portions, the triceps and the middle delts. So if you're someone who's looking to uh, sort of understand a lot of the principle based things that go into how we select exercises for what muscle groups and why, then this is the video for you. So without further ado, I'm just going to kind of go through like in an informal format, the entirety of my push day from start to finish. So my push day consisted of one, two, three, four, five different exercises. And this was the first of those five. So I tend to start with uh, motions that are specific toward the upper portions of the pecs, because that is a specific goal of mine. And on this particular day, what I started with was this prime um, converging chest press. And so what converging means is converging means that it's going from wider to more narrow, as you can see. And for the goal specifically, and I'll show multiple angles of this, for training the upper pack, we want to really keep in mind two different things. We want to use a slightly, slightly wider arm path, and you'll see how the wide arm path in this session differentiates from the narrow arm path. And we want to use a slight incline angle. Now I'll show the incline angle uh, from a different angle in just a little bit here. But something that's important to point out, just in case any of you were maybe slightly confused, was I do have this towel on my uh, left hand. <laughs> so in case any of you noticed that, the reason for that is because this uh, particular machine has a slight discrepancy between size in terms of how they trace. And so the left arm is actually slightly behind the right one. So I just put a towel there to sort of problem solve for that and make it even. Um, Another thing to note, and something that many of you may have already noticed, is that it does not look like I'm using the quote unquote full range of this motion. And I want to point out why, and I'll show a different angle here, um, just so we can see multiple perspectives. So the first thing to remember whenever we're talking about training, not just the upper portions of the pecs, but really any portions uh, of the pec, is that the pecs as a whole are much stronger in their more length and position. And so what this means and what this looks like is a sort of range of motion that looks a little bit, you know, similar or, or similar to what I'm doing in this particular case. Now, the other thing to point out about the specific range of motion is that it's always going to relate or it needs to relate to the direction of resistance of the exercise. So for example, if this were some kind of cable press, which was substantially loaded both in the bottom and in sort of the lock position where it was trying to pull my arms outward, then that would maybe be a different story uh, in relationship to something like a dumbbell press where in a dumbbell press, as you're going through the press, the weight is really, really heavy at the bottom. And then, and many of you probably know this just through your experience, when you get to the stack position of a dumbbell press, you can basically just hold the weights there and it doesn't feel like your pecs are fatiguing at all. So this particular machine, because it does converge, is kind of an in-between, right? And I'll show the other angle again, where it does converge a little bit, meaning it does go from wide to narrow. So it will load that short position. But notice that the machine arcs in this upward direction, right? So this is part of the reason that I'm setting it up this way for upper pecs in that it traces from slightly lower, look at the bottom, go back here, look at the bottom to look at the top, right? So you'll notice how this machine, I'll draw it on here. This is kind of the lever of this machine. And this is kind of where it starts and it finishes, right? So you see that the lever pivots from here and it goes upward, right? And because it goes upward, uh, in essence, what happens to your strength against the machine is because it's not perfectly in line with where your arms uh, are, are pivoting and moving. And you can't really change the, the way that you're gripping it throughout the range of motion. It basically just means that it makes it really, really freaking hard toward the lock position, so much so that if you pick a load that is appropriate on this machine for the lock position, you're going to end up being able to do like 50 different partials uh, uh, once you start to fatigue the length in position, or sorry, the short position. So in other words, what that means is if I could use 100 pounds and fully lock every single rep, um, I could probably use 150 pounds and just bang out the range of motion that I am here. Now, this has to do a lot with machine mechanics, and I, I don't really want to get into that stuff because it's kind of not really the point of this video. The point of this video now is to say, okay, well, I've done this motion for the upper pecs. And again, those boxes that I'm trying to check are basically just, all right, I'm doing something that is sort of resisting me at this slight incline angle. It's not super significant. And I'm also doing something at a slightly wider, oops, at a slightly wider um arm path, meaning that my arms are not super tucked into my sides down here. They're kind of out to the sides. So that is like upper pec territory, right? So if upper pecs are a goal of yours, slightly wider arm path, 
um, slight incline. That's sort of my go-to, right? And you can sort of accomplish that on this machine. But let's now look at like what a press on this machine could look like if it were not just for the upper pecs predominantly, and it's not that the other pecs aren't contributing here, but predominantly for the upper pecs, what is a predominantly mid to lower pec press look like? So to set up the mid and lower pec press, what you'll notice is that I'm now grabbing the neutral handles, the handles that are tighter, to create a tighter arm path. And again, the reason for this is really just in relationship or relates to the fiber direction and how the fiber direction relates to the shape of the rib cage of the upper packs versus the mid and the lower packs. And so if we view it from this angle, which is a little bit clearer of an angle to see here, what you'll notice too, is that I'm also leaning backward, right? And so when we tip backward, it's kind of like if you were on a flat bench uh, and you went from arching your back to not arching your back as much, the reason people can arch their back and maybe get more out of their press is because what that does is it basically turns the sternum upward, right? So if initially maybe this was the angle of my sternum, you see that it's sort of tipped backward this way now, right? So I'm essentially tipping it backward this way. And what that does is it changes the direction of resistance so that unlike before where I was actually sitting uh, up a little bit more upright against the bench pad right here, I'm actually angled forward. And so what that does is it forces me to load uh, at an angle, which is slightly low to high, right? So if this line right here, this red line right here is my torso, this is the direction of resistance at this particular point, right? And because that direction of resistance is not um, uh, uh, sort of flat or inclined, I'm basically, my arm is being basically pushed upward and backward, right? So you can think about this as sort of like a blend between a flat press and a dip. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. And so if the arm is getting sort of shoved, in this direction, we have to ask which tissues are pulling equal and opposite to that, the ones that kind of can emerge from the arm downward this way, i.e. the middle portions uh, of the pec and the lower portions of the pec, really. And what I mean by that is sort of this segment, right? So the lower half of the middle pecs, as well as the lower pecs right there are going to have a really, really good ability to pull the arm downward from this position. And so the difference not only between upper and lower pecs is in the arm path, right? Because the narrower arm path, as I've demonstrated here, is going to create much more length change in the mid to lower pecs. And the wider arm path is going to create much more length change in the upper pecs, but it's also the angle, right? So again, although it's a little bit hard to see from this particular angle from uh, this, this one straight forward, if you look at me from the side, right, I'm actually altering the direction of my torso such that when I go through the press, the handles are interacting with me differently. And that's a really, really good concept, I think, to remember is that even if you're using the same exact machine, the way that you alter your body, the how you set up relative to the machine, where you grab the machine, what range of motion on the machine that you use, all these things are going to directly impact your ability to push into the machine and that also what the stimulus in terms of a muscular perspective ends up being. So first press for me was a press for the upper pecs. I did two or three sets to failure there. This is a second press for me, two or three sets of failure here. And again, I'm really just using the partial range of motion in either case, not because using the full range is bad, but because using the full range in this case uh, really does not allow me in particular to get much out of this machine. If I go through the full range, I'm, I'm I tend to use very little load. And even when I do go through a greater range of motion, I end up banging out the partials. So what you'll notice with this press and also the, the previous one, and I'm not saying that any of you have to do this, but sort of watch just how I fatigue, right? So range uh, of motion starts to decrease. I let it decrease. And then I just go through the partials, right? So I'm basically just making sure that when I get to the end of the set, I got nothing left. I can't even get out of the bottom. Boom. And then the set is over. So the last uh, motion for the pecs, I did, I think, two or three sets of this to failure was a, a cable fly. And what you'll notice, uh, and I think many people skate over this uh, portion of the instruction because it's kind of awkward to, to demonstrate and it looks kind of silly. Uh, but what I like to do is I like to grab one of the cables first, wrap it around my body and lean, grab the other cable and then use the first cable to my advantage so that I can pull myself back. And then once I get to this point, I'm basically just going to keep my hands together here and sit my torso backward. And that's just going to basically make it easier for me to start the motion from a squeeze position and then sort of work out from there. I like to start flies from the squeeze position if I can. Obviously, it's a little hard to do that on a machine. Um, but when you can start from the squeeze position, and this may just totally change the game for some of you, when you start from the squeeze position, you can kind of recognize the end point. Uh, against which you can start to load that stretch. So watch what I do here. I keep my hands out away from me and then I sit back. And so my goals for this uh, particular motion was just to capture the short position, right? So both of the presses, again, because of that range of motion that I was sort of missing toward this lock position, we're training the length in position. And so that's a really important thing, I think, to remember in general, which is that 
no exercise exists in a vacuum, right? There's no exercise that you're going to do where you look at it and you look at the qualities of it and what it's good for and what it's not good for, not in relation to other things, right? Because you're always doing other exercises. So you should never, the point just being, you should never look at a single exercise, a single set, a single uh, um, uh, setup and say, oh, you know, this exercise is good or bad, right? It's just like, what is the context of this exercise and how does it fit into the broader uh, 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 framework of your program, right? So if I weren't doing any flies, it would probably be more sensible for me to do presses where I was fully locking in some way so that I could train this short position. And the reason I think it's important to train uh, all different positions of, of a muscle, the stretch and the short position, is because why wouldn't you? Like you have the time, you have the exercise options. Uh, you don't want to fully train one portion of a range of motion while neglecting another portion of the range. It doesn't mean that you have to train 100% of the range of every single tissue in the body all the time, but it does probably mean probably mean that on the whole, you want to make sure that you're not just grossly neglecting you know, a bunch of different uh, ranges uh, because you think that, you know, one particular position is best or, or whatnot. So I like to train the full train, uh, the full range of at least all the tissues that I'm training super consistently, right? So just the major muscle groups that people think of as the major muscle groups and the fly in, in relationship to the pecs is a great way to train that short squeeze position because you're bringing your arms together with a resistance that is pulling you outward. Remember that dumbbell press example. If you do a dumbbell press, you can basically just chill with the dumbbells here the whole time because it's, they're not pulling you outward. So to train the short position, the squeeze position, which is great for many different reasons that I won't get into right now, um, you know, aside from the stretch position or in tandem with the stretch position, rather, um, you need something that is pulling your arms outward. So for this particular uh, variation, my goal wasn't specific to any one of the pecs, any single pec. I just said, I'm going to strike a middle ground. I'm just going to squeeze the hell out of my arms and I'm just going to bring them together wherever it feels comfortable. You know, I like to personally set the cables around the height of my shoulder joint. That's not a hard and fast rule play around with the amount of elbow bend. Some people like the elbows even more bent than this. Some people kind of like to make it a press fly hybrid. hybrid. Some people like to do it with straight arms. Whatever happens to be the case, my piece of advice to you, specifically with flies, and this is something that I feel like is really uh, taught against or, or, or discouraged, which is really allow your shoulders to come forward. So a lot of people will, will make the claim that your shoulder blades should be locked back and down. And nothing specifically in the context of a fly, nothing could be farther from being helpful. Nothing could be farther from being accurate. And the reason this is true uh, is because of the fact that your shoulder girdle pivots around your rib cage and your middle and lower pecs specifically are really, really powerful protractors, meaning they pull the shoulder girdle forward. And so watch kind of what happens here around, it's just clear to see it on the left shoulder. Uh, watch what happens toward the end of this motion where it kind of seems like my shoulders are almost coming forward and around. That is my intent with this motion. It's to bring my shoulder blades back and sort of upward because back and up is where they move. They don't move back and down. Back and up are paired actions, not back and down. I'll repeat, not back and down. Back and up. And then as you come forward, it's kind of like forward and down. And if you don't allow those shoulder blades to come forward, if you intentionally pin them backward, what you are doing is you are limiting the ability of the pecs to contract and coordinate that motion. So restricting shoulder blade motion, specifically in this case, you want to allow that protraction to happen because that's what's going to allow you to actually squeeze your hands together more powerfully. And this, this can be really, really eye-opening, by the way, for a lot of you who have been uh, uh, pinning your shoulder blades back and down for a very long time which again, you can't technically do because it's backing up, remember? Um, but for those of you who maybe have not found flies comfortable, that might be a part of the reason why. So uh, backing up with the shoulder blades, just sort of let the shoulder blades follow the arms and vice versa. And then as you come forward, let me play this. As you come forward, make sure that you're allowing those shoulder blades to come forward. That doesn't mean slump over and just round over your chest like you're a dog taking a shit, but it does mean do not restrict motion of the scaphs and make sure that as you're sort of ra coming around the corner, so to speak, of the fly, that you're bringing your hands together and you're allowing those shoulder blades to move forward. All right, so next I moved on to my single triceps exercise for the day. I have one triceps uh, exercise and one middle delt exercise, and it's important to remember that I'm also training another push day uh, three with three days rest after this day. Um, so just remember that context and don't assume that I'm only doing you know this one triceps exercise throughout the week. Uh, again, to our earlier conversation about the exercise vacuum. Uh, and this triceps variation is, is definitely one of my favorites to do. It's single arm. It's really... 
uh, easy to set up relative to your individual structure and goals. This will train 100% of all the triceps. Do not worry. Do not listen to people that tell you that this is only going to train the long head or this is only going to train the lateral and the medial heads. Uh, all these all these triceps extension motions where the arm, the humerus is stable like this, they're going to train all three heads of the triceps. And what you'll notice now is basically once I fatigued the concentric where I couldn't push down on my own anymore, actually, you like to use my opposite hand to, to assist that part of the motion. And then I like to control the eccentric upward uh, toward toward the top. And this is really, really, um, you know, if you're gonna if you're new to this technique, this technique is really gonna fuck you up. Um, so make sure that you sort of grade the exposure to it, um, you know, intelligently. Don't do you know as many sets if you're gonna do it this way. Um, and the only other uh, note on this, honestly, from a mechanics perspective, is just to note sort of what happens with the direction of resistance here. So notice that that is the direction of resistance for my hand. And if I draw out what are known as the moment arms to either joint, right? So this is the shoulder joint and this is the elbow joint. Notice how far that, uh, or how much longer rather that green line is on the bottom compared to the top. And what this in essence translates to practically is there is much more resistance on the elbow in this case as compared to the shoulder. So if many of you have traditionally done your triceps extensions where you're kind of standing maybe somewhere over here, like away from the cable stack and the cable, let's say, is pulling you forward, a lot of you will experience a lot of weird shoulder stuff because the cable is actively trying to pull you forward. So I prefer the cable to actually be going upward and backward like this, because if it is going upward and slightly backward like this, you're going to proportionately load the shoulder very little, a la that moment arm, that's essentially what that's called, that distance, and a la this moment arm, right, this distance. So there's so much more force in the elbow here. And if you do, let's say, like a traditional rope extension where you're facing the stack, it can be much harder to actually execute this motion without some kind of like shoulder compensation. So again, pretty simple, uh, just keeping the arm stable. If any of you are curious, I am holding a ankle cuff on my hand. You don't have to use a cuff, but I definitely prefer to just have something looped around the bottom of my hand. So if I didn't have a, an ankle cuff, what I would use is probably something like the, just the regular D handle and I would loop the handle, all, you know, the, the webbing of the handle around my hand rather than uh, holding it. But that's fairly straightforward. Uh, here's just a slightly different angle that you can maybe see that is maybe uh, helpful just a little bit closer up. Again, principles are the same. I kind of lean into it forward. And then as I get fatigued, what I like to do is use my other hand, assist the concentric, allow it to allow myself to control the eccentric on the way up. And then boom, push down with the opposite hand, let go with the opposite hand, control up. Right. And basically just do that until it's really, really hard or impossible to push down with my opposite side hand. So last motion of the day was a wire raise. I did this for the middle delt and specifically uh, the posterior portions of the middle delt, which is just a fancy way to say, if you picture sort of the middle delt, the side delt, the more the portion, which is more sort of toward the back side of it, is going to get trained really well with this sort of wire raise, lateral raise hybrid. I am using an ankle cuff, right? So um, same ankle cuff that I was just using with the triceps extension. And um, I can, I like it because I can standardize the distance. There's like a little bit of webbing on the, uh, on the ankle cuff. And I personally like it on my forearm for a bunch of different reasons, uh, which maybe is a topic for another YouTube video because that might take a little while. But the short of it is that it just feels smoother with a, with a point of application that's not at the hand and where you don't have to deal with wrist, forearm, you know, finger flexor, finger extensor forces, and where you can really just focus on and isolate the shoulder. And I did the same thing here that I'm doing, or that I did in the, in the triceps extension, where I'm sort of aiding that concentric as I get fatigued. And then I'm allowing myself to control the eccentric again with any single arm cable motion, especially dumbbells too, but cables uh, are easier to do it with. Uh, I really like this as a strategy. It's just like, there's no other kind of fatigue that you can feel like this. Um, you could look at it as like an assisted drop or whatever you call it. I don't really, I don't care what you call it, but it's just like you're extending a set more than you normally would. Uh, and so then if I show this other angle here, again, same principle uh, in, in some other notes insofar as setup is notice toward the bottom portion of the range, I am loading kind of like this. This is not the perfect perspective to draw this from, but I'm loading basically close to 90 degrees uh, at the bottom portion of the range. And the reason that I am not moving really above the point which you see me moving to, which is basically just like 90 degrees out to the side, um, is because the middle delt specifically is going to contribute most in a relative sense to the motion just in this bottom half, right? So a lot of people will do lateral raises all the way overhead. There's nothing wrong with that. But the proportion of muscle recruitment in that case will shift much more to things like the upper traps, the middle traps, and even, even lower traps um, to, to work through that uh, upward rotation, right? So the middle delta is really just going to control the shoulder joint. 
And so what that means is that if you are doing a lateral raise for the middle delt specifically, I would recommend, especially with a cable, loading it close to 90 degrees at the bottom. It doesn't have to be exactly 90. And then just basically moving in like a horizontal direction and don't worry too much about moving upward. Uh, and, and, and what you'll notice from just a, a fatigue perspective is that any of you who are uh, those kinds of people who like really feel their traps a lot when they do lateral raises, you'll feel much, much more middle delt doing it this way, just because of the direction of loading and the direction that the middle delt actually creates motion in relationship to that direction of loading. So this is basically the last exercise that I had. I did a couple sets of failure here. Um, I'll train all these tissues again in a couple of days. Uh, and so uh, maybe I will do another video on my uh, second push day of the week if any of you are interested. If you all like this sort of more informal format, me just sort of going through these exercises, talking through them, describing different aspects of them and, and kind of how to set them up and some pointers, please let me know because I'm happy to do more informal videos uh, uh, like this in the future. And if any of you have questions about push days, any of those topics that I talked about today, please let me know and uh, I'll see you on the next video. If you like this content and you want to learn more from me, you definitely need to check out the Modern Meathead community. Inside the community, you'll get direct access to me for one-on-one -on -one personalized feedback. In addition, you'll get access to hundreds of hours of premium content exclusive to members only. When you get inside the community, you'll get direct access to all these different features. Now, I make daily posts covering different exercises where I post videos of exercises directly, the anatomy of those exercises, and very specific breakdowns relative to whatever the goals of that exercise are. In addition, members are posting things every day with comments and questions of their own and what you can see is as we go through all these different kinds of posts I respond to everything every question every comment directly and I'll give direct feedback in the comment section as to all the different exercise variations you post in addition when you look over to the left side of your community we have all these different community forms but you'll also get access to all these different courses that I have on biomechanics programming pain-free training as well as coaching and queuing and when you click into the course you'll see your videos on the left and then all the different other videos of the course on the right side in addition you'll also get access to an exercise library where I'm constantly adding new exercises, basically everything that I film in the gym with step-by-step -step tutorials. You'll also get access to previous Q&A recordings that I do on Instagram and live in the community, as well as all these other specific member lectures, which can last from 30 minutes to an hour every single week. You'll also get access to premium articles, eBooks, and all of my training programs with just one subscription. So if you want to learn more about the anatomy of lifting and a community of like-minded individuals who are all lifting obsessed, you can start your seven-day free trial zero risk subscription today.